Hi, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's uh, virtual West Cork Literary Festival event. We're here tonight with Tori Peters and Aoife Martin. Um, and I'm going to hand you over to Aoife and Tori in a couple of minutes. Um, but first of all, I just want to let you know that we have a full schedule of events throughout the month of July. And these are now on our website, westcorkmusic.ie forward slash LF program. Our virtual events will be a mix of live Zoom events like tonight and events pre-recorded in Bantry. We also have a number of live outdoor events in Bantry over the next three days, and we have a small number of tickets still available for those. So hopefully we'll see you at other events over, over the coming weeks. Um, all of our events are made possible by the support of our funders, the Arts Council of Ireland, Cork County Council and their Library and Arts Services, Vulture Ireland and the Creative Europe Programme of the European Union. All of the books featured in this year's festival are available from our local Bantry bookshop, and I would encourage you all to support bookshops wherever you are and to support your local bookshop wherever you live. Um, tonight, Tori is going to be in conversation with Aoife Martin. Aoife is an IT professional and a columnist with the journal.ie. She's passionate about books and she co-runs an online book club. As well as the journal.ie, her articles have appeared in the Irish Times, Image Magazine, Irish Tatler and several other publications. She sits on the board of Tenny, the Transgender Equality Network of Ireland, and she enjoys writing, going to the cinema and swimming in her spare time. So I'm now going to hand you over to Aoife and Aoife will introduce you to Tori and I wish you all a wonderful event. Hello everybody and welcome to this um, event. Um, I'm delighted to welcome Tori Peters to join us today to discuss her book Detransition Baby. Um, Tori Peters lives in Brooklyn and holds an MFA from the University of Iowa and a Master's in Comparative Literature from Dartmouth. She is the author of two novellas, Infect Your Friends and Loved Ones and The Massacre. Detransition Baby is her first novel and was long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction. So without further ado, Tori, welcome to the West Cork Literary Festival. Um, although neither of us are actually in West Cork at the moment, thanks to the magic of the internet. Um, and yeah, so, uh, Sarah, so where are you joining, joining us from today? I'm in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, which is uh, basically about as far north in Brooklyn as you can get uh, before you're in Queens. It's like a, it's an old, Pol it used to be a Polish neighborhood. And now it's associated with sort of um, if you if you've seen the television show Girls, it's where mm -hmm. Girls was filmed. <laughs> okay, uh, appro appropriately enough. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, I, I was kind of hoping you actually you'd be coming from the wilds of Vermont because I know you you have a cabin in Vermont, and I was sort of hoping you'd be, you'd be some sort of feral trans woman out living her life out there. <laughs> I mean, I, I do that. I'm a part time feral. I'm part time feral. I, I'm not fair. I'm, I'm moving towards full time feral. But no, uh, there's no uh, I bought this like uh, this. It was an abandoned cabin in the woods in the National Forest in Vermont. So you have to hike in to get there and there's no water. There's we just put solar power. So we've got power. But it's, it was supposed to be my writing retreat. And uh, it's kind of nice, but like I also enjoy a shower like more frequently than 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 I would get if I lived there. So I I I come back to Brooklyn and um, and most of my times I like the I like the idea that I live in the woods. It's like a, it's a fun image, but I actually live in Brooklyn most of the time, and that's where my friends and other writers and things are. Yeah. So um so. You know, to start by asking, you know, how has lockdown been for you? I mean, the book came out in January, and it must be really strange launching a book in the middle of a global pandemic. You know, I, I, it was strangely okay for me. I know other writers who really, um, who didn't enjoy it very much and who had a hard time having traction. But one of the things that I think happened for me is that the a lot of my early readers were, were trans women and trans women are used to spending time, I mean, not to, to, to invoke a cliche, but trans women are used to spending time on the internet. And so the, they weren't uh, put out by the idea that like all the events that I was gonna do were gonna be online events. They, they were happy to kind of show up for it. And in a certain way, um, you know, the fact that the book got traction in the UK I don't know if that would have happened had there not been a pandemic. I think that suddenly books were more global. The conversations were global. People in the UK could drop in on my events in the States. People in the States would drop in on my events on the, in the UK. 
I mean, I noticed like even just the fact that so much of the ways that books are talked about are things like Instagram. It was interesting if I looked up like hashtag detransition baby, you know, there was there were the 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 British cover is pink, but the American cover is green. And I can sort of just see squares of green and pink and see where the book was traveling uh, in a way that I don't know. I mean, maybe it would have been the same uh, without the pandemic, but I, I do think that the fact that it felt like more a conversation across different borders um, was kind of unique to the unique to this moment. And, and I don't know if a debut novelist, I think debut novels usually stay a little bit more local. I mean, that's been my, my, the way I've seen it. So I, I kind of appreciate in a certain way um, that I get to do something like that I get to talk in, in, in West Cork Literary Festival as opposed to Bushwick down the block, which is where normally we're talking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as someone who goes to a lot of um, sort of book talks as, as an audience member, I, I mean, you know, lockdown has been a bit of a blessing. It means I don't have to actually physically be there. I can just log on and just, you know, attend, which is really nice as an audience member, I think. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think that I went to my first. I went to my first in-person reading since the, since the book launched in January, and it was, it was both. I kind of love it. Like my particular tradition of writing comes out of a very local scene of trans women in, in, in Brooklyn. It started in 2014, and I mean it kind of imploded. But in 2014, we were we saw ourselves as sort of like the trans version of the Harlem Renaissance or maybe like Paris in the 1920s. And it was, it was this highly local thing where we hung out in the same bars. We went to the same readings. And, you know, when you, part of writing your work is if you wrote something that was inflammatory or you wrote something that was provocative or anything like that, you were gonna have to look the other women that you were writing about in the face, you were going to read it to their face. And there was something very powerful about that sort of hyper local um, literary scene, you know, and a lot of the writing, you know, including my own, like, it was, it maybe wasn't good at that time. Like, you know, we were, we were experimenting with each other, and it was very bounded in this little world that we had created. So it's interesting now to have almost the opposite thing happening in in the launch of this debut novel, which grew from this hyper-local scene where there, there wasn't a kind of uh, locality to the, to the publicity at least. And uh, there wasn't any, uh, you know, I didn't, I had to look people in the face over Zoom, but that's really different than like, you know, when a Zoom calls over, you hang up. And uh, if someone doesn't like your work, the, you don't necessarily have to hear it. And, uh, it was interesting for me to, to do this event. It was the first one in person and, and realized like, you know, when I told a joke or I read a joke from the book, um, I could see how it landed in a room full of people, which, which is, is really different to, to, get to, to get that effect. And, you know, I would tell a joke, there's jokes in here that are like about trans women and that, you know, feel like you really have to be in on the joke to, to, to you know, to get it. And realizing that like, oh, maybe people don't like this joke or, or, or this half of the room likes this joke and this half of the room thinks the joke is offensive. And, uh, and they're gonna tell me when this reading is over. Um, that, was, that was something I think I missed. I missed that, uh, that sense of community because I think it, for good or ill, like I don't think that community is a magical thing, but I do think that I'm a writer who comes out of a community and that generally when I'm writing, I'm thinking about specific people and how this book is gonna land with those people. And now I think it's possible that my community is enlarged because of things like the pandemic and the internet, but I still, I still do feel answerable to readers. Yeah, I mean, you know, Coming, coming, coming now to the book itself. I mean, the De transition baby. It's it's a really interesting title, um, and like in one way, it perfectly en encapsulates what the book is about. Um, 
And in another way, it's setting out its stall very early. Like it's, you know, it's saying this book is its own thing. And we are going to talk about things that might be uncomfortable for members of the trans community. Like detransition is often used, you know, is often weaponized against trans people, you know. So, so what, why that title in particular? What, did it take you long to come up with that? No, the title was one of the first things I came up with. And, um, you know, for me, the, one of the things I talk about is that the comma is actually quite crucial. The comma is like a knife's edge that at the time that I was writing it, it felt like I existed on the knife's edge. It was sharp, it was a painful, tight place. And if I could just fall to one side or the other, if I could fall towards motherhood, towards baby, towards that kind of acceptance of, of a sort of incontrovertible womanhood, uh, you know, if I could fall that way, I would be okay. Or if I could just figure out a way to live, to detransition and live in a way that felt comfortable, that would be okay. But in fact, my existence falls on this knife at not this knife edge of these two these two not opportunities, but options um, that I actually couldn't reach, motherhood or or manhood, uh, in a certain way. And so, uh, and so the that was like the, the the real meaning that was the emotional meaning and then I liked that it was like you know it was like I had the Hemingway short story you know the the shortest the for sale baby shoes never worn like Hemingway's shortest story was six words and to basically be like well I beat Hemingway by, by four words <laughs> um that that felt good and then lastly you know I grew up in uh I grew up in an era where where baby was just appended to things in in pop culture you know so you had like I remember that like Terminator 2 was Hasta La Vista, baby, or, or, or Virginia Slims was You've Come a Long Way, baby. And so this like appending baby to something made it, gave it this sort of like poppiness that in some ways confused a bunch of different things. So I was, I always, I, I came up with it and I was always like, this is going to be the title. And Random House was not so sure about that title for, because they're like, is it nonsensical? Is it weird to have a comma if you end, you know, index it online? And then of course the biggest thing, which is that is detransition a dangerous thing to talk about, you know? And can we put detransition right in the title? For me, I felt like the title tells you what you're gonna get on the inside. Like if you don't like the title, you're not gonna like the content. So it's in some ways a trigger warning, you know, like if the title triggers you, don't buy this book, don't open this book. Um, and, uh, the other, the, the, the last thing I'll say is sort of about that is, is, is also that I think that, that the idea of seeding detransition as a concept to be talked about to, to basically bigots, uh, I don't agree with that as a strategy. It doesn't seem like a sound political strategy that if somebody weaponizes a concept, we just say, okay, it's yours and we can never talk about it because in fact, you know, people do detransition. There's a character in the book, detransitions. And the reason that people detransition, in my experience, isn't because they were wrong about their gender, but because it's simply hard to be a trans person. And they detransition because they can't get jobs, because their family rejects them, because it's just difficult. And if we say that we can't talk about that experience, well, then we're ostracizing a lot of those people. And if we say that it's a it's a it's too dangerous to, to say that those people exist, well then where do those people exist? They're going to be lost. I, I think that it's okay to talk about things like regret and transition. You know, it, when you make a hard decision, you may regret it. Transition's a hard decision. And I talk about, you know, sometimes people move across the country for a job and it doesn't work out. And we don't say nobody should ever move across the country for a job. And what's more, we should never talk about people moving across the country for a job because there is the possibility of regret. No, I think what you do is you say, this is sometimes you move across the country for a job and it doesn't work out. It doesn't make you a bad person. Failures happen. Even if you're, failures can happen to extremely talented people and we should create an environment where you can try again. So, for me, that's been the attitude that I've had towards detransition, that it's not something to be ashamed of. And the only way to dispel shame is to speak, is to, is to write, make art about it, to talk about it, 
that's how you that's how you move through not not around shame but you move through shame yeah yeah no that that makes perfectly perfect sense i mean you know as you said you know there you know a lot of a lot of you know, there are a number of trans people who have detransitioned but there are also quite a lot of trans people who have thought about detransitioning i think you know i think it's it's something that affects us all it's certainly something you know i thought about for a while because like you said being trans is, is difficult it's not an easy thing and being trans in a world that is inherently transphobic is is, is very yeah. very difficult you know and um, so i i know you're going to sort of read a piece from the novel would you would you like to read read something first so that people get a flavor sure. of the book sure i'm going to read from a section that uh you know i know zoom readings are, are a bit hard so i'll try and make this fast but i'm going to read from the section this book is about motherhood in many different ways. Um, biological motherhood, I think trans girls mother each other. Um, there's all sorts of kind of maternal relationships that that are in this book. So I'm going to write, read a section with the protagonist, Reese, is seeing a young trans girl who's just transitioned and has motherly feelings towards that trans girl. <clears throat> On a last minute whim, Reese decided to go see her friend Talia's weekly set at Dynamite, one of several North Brooklyn queer dive bars run by the same shady family of straight people. Talia was a former drag queen turned transsexual, one of the earliest converts in the dra great drag enlightenment, when a significant quorum of Brooklyn's queens came out as trans, began to inject estrogen, and were announced their gay past the consequences of which miffed them into misandry as the desperately cute twinks who used to sleep with them now no longer would. Talia runs a set called Anger Management in which she plays tropical dubstep to keep everyone chill, then undercuts her chill vibes with hourly advice sessions in which she solicits Ann Lander style questions from the various twinks who form her now sexually unavailable fan base, then berates them for their stupidity in profound and profane harangues. It was reliably the most entertaining way for Reese to spend a Tuesday night. Tonight, one of the twinks asks about sharing chores in a relationship. The twink has found that in his relationship with a masked dom, he is doing much more household work. So can he employ feminist arguments for a more equitable share in the domestic labor? To which Tally responds that no, he is a little bitch. And in the, in the midst of a shortage of actual true to God dom tops, he had best start scrubbing if he wants to keep his man happy. However, Talia adds, the whole premise of the question ought to be rejected because there's no such thing as a pure mask top. Everyone will eventually want something in their butt because that is the nature of having a butt. When the moment comes that things get equitable in bed, so should they be in domestic labor. The twinks giggle happily, but Talia rebukes them and demands that they give her quarters for her laundry because her parents have cut off her money as a consequence for yelling at them on the phone. For emphasis, she shakes her tip bucket from the pedestal slash DJ booth from which she reigns, then segues into one of her favorite themes, her parents. Her parents are good, long-suffering people, she tells the assembled twinks, and these good, long-suffering people still support her at age 29 because she is a spoiled brat who has never had a job. A weekly show at a queer bar doesn't count, which is an embarrassment to her. And what does she do to repay her parents for their generosity? She spits the words into the mic so acerbically that it pops with her consonants, then pauses a second before answering her own question in mock outraged oration. She changed her gender, just to stymie and confuse them. And now she yells at them on the phone and hangs up on them if they misgender her. That's what they get for supporting a child with artistic tendencies. But what else did they expect? Did they think they could just let their child wear capri pants and there would be no consequences? And do you know the worst part Talia demands of her twinks? The worst part is that most parents get to one day have a moment of comeuppance when their parents, when their kids become parents and those kids reassess their own childhood with the parents' eyes and regret, regretfully admit that dad knew best along and mommy was so generous and so kind, so beautiful and young. <clears throat> but not my parents, Talia concludes with a cackle because with all the hormones, now I'm sterile. I stole that comeuppance from them. The cute boys in cutoff shorts lined up along the bar laugh. Talia theatrically narrows her eyes at them. What are you all laughing at? If you're here listening to me, she admonishes, it means you're 
also a disappointment to your parents. If you like my shtick and didn't just wander in off the street, there's a high probability that you are also a degenerate who will never give your parents a grandchild. Talia spits out her gum in a peek, then continues on to the next question unabated. <clears throat> Talia had given Reese a drink ticket and Reese laughs happily along with the rants, sipping on a free Corona. Reese sort of loves Talia's parents, or at least Talia's version of them. She em empathizes with them. They make all the classic parents of a trans mistakes, but unlike Reese's own parents, they seem to truly and deeply love their child, as baffling and confusing as they find her. Reese can relate. Talia is deeply lovable and talented and spoiled and capable of inexplicable rage, which also makes her one of the most compelling girls Reese knows. Talia, Talia also happens to be one of the most talented musicians in the city, though she prima donnishly refuses almost all offers to perform. Her parents' largesse allows her to avoid the grind of petty performances, which lesser musicians accept primarily in order to eat and secondarily to build up a following. Talia's talents explain only a part of Reese's deep affection for her. Reese knows a lot of talented people. Half the trans women in Brooklyn live in a state of perpetual pre-celebrity, awaiting a well-deserved recognition that will never come. No, more than simply finding Talia compelling, Reese secretly and proudly thinks of Talia as her trans daughter. Reese shares this with almost no one because she'd be mortified to take public credit for how remarkably level Talia has turned out to be, even though in her own mind, she deserves a healthy share of that credit. So I'll stop there. Oh, that was, um, yeah, it's um, one of the things I'm interested in is the, um, the the narrative voice on the novel. I mean, it's it's you know it's cozy, it's intimate, it's gossipy. It, it's like you know listening to your best friend just 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 telling you a story. How how did you come up with that voice? What was it difficult to find? That voice, the the more gossipy voice. So. I think of this book as having actually two voices. Um, the gossipy voice, the kind of catty, bitty, bitchier voice. I think that belongs to Reese. And that was the voice that came to me first. That, that voice was a little bit how I talked with some of my friends, not all my friends, but you know, we'd sort of click into a mode and gossip with each other and be a little bit bitchy. Um, that, that voice is harder for me to access now. Like I'm in a different place in my life where I am maybe a little less bitchy and gossipy <laughs> with my friends, but that voice was natural to me um, in some ways. The voice that was harder to find was the Ames voice um, because Ames is a detransition character who is very dissociated. He's distant from his body. He's distant from his experience. There's a space between himself and the world as he experiences it. And the trouble for me was in finding a way to make somebody who's distanced from their experience also vivid and alive. And I found it, um, I found that voice actually while I was on a trip to Mexico. I went with a friend of mine who was getting surgery, a trans surgery uh, until the ACA passed. Most of the trans girls I know got their surgeries in Mexico where it was cheaper. So I went along to take care of her and I hadn't yet changed my passport. So I had a, a passport that said male on it. And, um, and so I, I didn't wanna deal with customs. So I found this, this old suit and uh, it was sort of like a reservoir dog style suit, like kind of like a skinny tie, black suit, white. And I, I was like, well, I'll wear this and I'll go through customs to not have to deal with gender stuff. I mean, I looked like a kind of androgynous weirdo in the suit. So I flew to Mexico in it. And, um, and it was at a time when I was a little bit sad, like where things were hard for me as a trans woman. And, uh, and I wasn't exactly considering detransition, but it was like, it was looming. It was present as like a possibility for me. Uh, I didn't have a job at the time. It was just, it was difficult. Uh, so anyway, I arrived to Mexico, went through customs, it was fine. And then the airline lost my luggage. So all I had was a suit uh, in Guadalajara. And I ended up like walking around in the suit, sort of mumbling in a sort of like fey reservoir dog style, like for a week. And in that process, that 
I, I think I got a little dissociated and, um, and that became the voice of Ames. Like the, the way that everything felt vivid and important, but also a little distant from me. Um, I would picture myself in Guadalajara in that suit and that would then, then it was easy to write Ames. And when Ames came into being, I also felt like the distinction between Ames and, and Reese, even though they're both using my language, I could feel those, the different emotional resonances and Reese became more Reese, Ames became more Ames. Um, but it was, a, it was a process. I think it was about a year before those, those voices clicked into place. And then I had to revise a little bit. Yeah, so, um, so we, have, we have three characters in the novel. So we have Reese, who is a trans woman, um, Ames um, slash Amy, um, a detransitioned trans woman. And Katrina, who is the cis woman, um, which which is your favorite character, and which which was the easiest or the most difficult to write? Uh, I've gone through phases. I mean, there's like a joke about sort of like, are you an like in the way that people say about Sex in the City, are you like a Carrie or are you a Samantha? Like, people will sort of be like, are you names or Reese or Katrina? And uh, I started out feeling very close to Reese. And then I went through a harder period of my life and I felt closer to Ames. And I think since publishing, I have felt a little bit closer to Katrina. Katrina is the one person who's, who the, the other two are written in a free and direct style. So you're really inside their head. But Katrina, I started writing that way. And then I decided that actually there've been lots of books about pregnant cis women and that pregnant cis women are well equipped to tell their own stories. They didn't need me to sort of re you know, restage that in my book. So I would focus on these two trans characters whose voices I think maybe people hadn't heard as much. And also that way the book would be one third less long. Um, but there's a way in which now that the book is over, I'm very interested in Katrina. I'm, I'm really interested in, in her way of seeing the world. I'm interested in the ways that she's, she was unafraid of power, I think in a way that the, that the two trans women were afraid of power. Um, and, um, and I'm interested in, in I'm interested in, in when something is so urgent, when you have stakes in, in something like gender, the way that Katrina does, uh, you know, she's pregnant and she has to figure out how to make a life. The way that that cuts through a lot of the ways that the, the discourse around gender, right? That like, you got two weeks to decide if you're going to keep a baby. At some point, who cares about pronouns? Who cares about, I mean, they're all very important and, and, and stuff like that. But like, there's a next level of like, what happens when you when you kind of have to, when you don't have time to read the sort of etiquette handbook and you just have to like get real with people. Um, I think Katrina, Katrina had to do that. And I'm sort of interested in, in, in having stakes with people. And, and that when I create situations where we have shared stakes, um, a lot of the sort of ways that things get talked about, about, you know, the proper way to discourse, they, they, they go out the window because um, we're all flawed and, and we all don't know the right thing to say all the time, but still we have to take action. We have to move forward. Mm. Yeah. So, I mean, one of the things I, I loved about the book is that it, it's unapologetically a trans story and it deals with trans culture and even subcultures within the trans community. Um, what made you, it doesn't sort of, it doesn't bow down to a cis audience, so it doesn't, you know, it doesn't cater to a cis audience necessarily. What made you decide to take that approach and to, you know, to allow a cis audience to, you know, to keep up basically, I suppose? Well, I think that it's, um, I think that part of it came from that scene that I was talking about in Brooklyn mm -hmm. in 2014, where we were, it was the idea that we we're writing for a trans audience and, um, and it was very similar, it was sort of a trans version of Toni Morrison's idea that she writes for black women, that 
um, instead of expect and that that the black experience is actually a universal experience in the same way that the white experience has been posited as a universal experience. Um, we basically were like, well, why can't that be true for the trans experience? That actually the trans experience, um, everybody has a gender, everybody's dealing with their gender. Um, and that that trans experience of dealing with your gender is actually a universal experience in some ways. The book is dedicated to, to divorced cis women. And that happened because there's, a, you know, the sort of short answer of that is that happened because I think that the trajectory of a divorce and the trajectory of a, of a transition are very similar. You think your life is gonna be a certain way, then there's a break and you have to go forward without either reinvesting in old illusions or getting bitter. And so, but the reason that's dedicated is that I was seeing parallels between my own experience and all of these cis women that I knew and that I was reading about. I was reading Rachel Cusk. I was reading Elena Ferrante. I was, I was looking at all these writers and I was relating to what they were saying, especially in their divorce stories. And I was like, I think I have something to say to them too. I actually think that this is a conversation and actually rather than doing the sort of like stay in your lane, like you're cis so you don't get to comment on trans issues, et cetera, et cetera. I wanted to be like, let's have an exchange because honestly, you all have taught me so much. I think that I have something, maybe some language about gender or trans lens on gender that would be useful to you as a cis reader. So I'm gonna have that exchange, but in the same way that the, you know, Elena Ferrante is a unapologetically cis lens on the world. And I was able to follow it and love it and, and feel that it approached me. There's no reason why a trans lens uh, can't be equally relatable and open to a cis readership and that that cis readership can't take from it things that relate to their own lives. I mean, something I get frustrated about is that people people who read this book and they'd be like, well, as a cis woman, you know, I just have to accept what Tori says. Well, no, the, the, when I read a, a book by a cis reader, I don't say, oh, well, I'm trans. So I have nothing to say about this cis reader's work. If I did that, I would have nothing to say about any books, basically. So in the same way, I think that, that, that cis readers can read a book about trans women. And they can say that this actually relates to my life, this language, about gender and about the way that that different people of different genders treat each other and and the sort of frames around it are applicable to me and that these lenses that trans people have developed might actually be quite useful for me to pick up and instead of saying like no that belongs to trans people i'm kind of like have at it i would love for cis people to pick up trans language and apply it to their life um, and i think that that has actually been for people who really love the book, a real appeal of it um, is when you can say that this book is for me as a cis person. And so even though this is a trans lens, it's for me as a cis person, as opposed to saying it can't possibly be for me. Mm. And you know, speak, speaking of, of cis readers and trans readers, how has the reaction been um, both within the trans community and outside the trans community? I mean, it's... <laughs> It's been, you know, it's it's sort of like I end up speaking out of both sides of my mouth because, or, or, or speaking to two audiences at once. I guess the other one has a connotation of lying. I don't mean that I'm lying. I mean that uh, I'm speaking to two different people at once. On one hand, I'm speaking to, to very specific trans audiences. And on one hand, I'm speaking to a much larger readership. And oftentimes um, I will get, totally opposite reactions from the same sort of readership. So, so uh, from trans people, I'll have people be like, I can't believe you shared our secrets with all these cis people from one half of the trans community saying like, you've, you've, you've aired our dirty laundry. And the other thing, because this really is about family and motherhood and, and quite traditional things, they'll say, you're an assimilationist. You're, you're doing to trans culture what happened to the gay community where you're just making it palatable to assist people and you're making it 
uh, you're assimilating us where, and you're, you're ruining what's special about us by putting us into this context of families. And really we should be uh, you know, radically breaking from that. So, you know, on one hand, I'm too oversharing. On the other hand, I'm a conservative, uh, neither of which I think is true, by the way. Uh, and then in, from cis readership, I get very similar things where it's, where, you know, on one hand, I'm, I'm quite evil and quite uh, dangerous. And on the other hand, uh, it's a big hit with book clubs in America, you know, like it's, it's like, it's not, this isn't a, a like a, a radical, it ends up being not a radical text. It's a book that's on like Good Morning America and discussed in Oprah and like, um, you know, very mainstream places, uh, which I didn't expect that the, the, like, so it's funny because like the mainstream is saying, this is a very, just a family book, family friendly. And then you have other people saying that this book is, is you know, absolute filth. Um, and so it's it's been, you know, you there's been nothing for me to do except say okay because if I try to assuage one person or one view of it, then I'm giving ammo to the other. So I just have to say, well, you know, this is what authors go through, and and um, you know, I will say the the I've been heartened because because for instance in the UK the book was long listed for the Women's Prize. And uh, there was a backlash to it. There was a, a backlash, uh, you know, that that a trans woman should be uh, nominated for a women's prize. And uh, the the backlash was quite uh, quite vicious. It wasn't really about the literary merits of the book. It was really an attack on me and my gender and. Um, and there was a lot of like, you know, kind of slanderous things said. And I was taken aback initially, but what ended up happening, uh, and, and in the end I came away with a lot of trust for readers is that uh, a lot of people went and read it and they went and bought it. Uh, and they said, they were like, well, let me just see what it actually says. And, um, and the book actually became a number five bestseller in the UK it never got that high in the United States. Um, so in the UK, this place where a lot of the most sort of like, uh, there's kind of an ugliness towards trans women was emanating from also turned out to be the largest bastion of support. And I came away from this experience, not really caring that much about the prize, the prize is what it is, but feeling like, oh, there's a lot of people who were hungry for this and they found it and they supported me. Um, and that is really the best thing you could ever ask for as an author. Like I, I don't, I, that was, that was really wonderful. Yeah, I mean, I, I remember the backlash and in, you know, in my experience, um, you know, the vast majority of cis people are supportive of trans people. It's just that there's a very, very small minority out there. It's just that they're very, very vocal and they have access to the media. I think that's, yeah. you know, and that's where all this is coming from. Um, so I wanted to touch on, um, you know, in, in 2014, so you know, the Time magazine caught, had an article called The Transgender Tipping Point. I think it was Laverne Cox was on the cover. Yeah. And 2016, you, you started writing Detransition Baby. Um, so a lot of things have happened since then in terms of trans rights and you know, there's bathroom bills, there's um, fury over, you know, you know, changing rooms, there's, um, you know, a storm over, you know, trans, you know, should trans women be allowed to play sport? Um, there's, there's a trans athlete in the Olympics this year. Um, if you were writing the book today, would you do anything different? Would you would you leave stuff out? Would you put stuff in? No, I think I think if I was writing the book today, I couldn't have written this book. I think this book is of a place in time, you know, and and I think that my thoughts about what's going on now will hopefully be in the next book. Um, I mean, I, I'm I'm not the writer who wrote this book anymore, and that's the thing about being a writer is that you kind of you you 
you, it's a snapshot of who you were. The voice that's in this book, I'll sometimes read lines and I'll be like, I wrote that, like, that's what, that's what I thought. Uh, and it, in some ways it delights me, you know, that, that, that this, that I could find in this book by me, an author who feels so different from me. Um, but I do think, uh, I do think that 2000, 2014, um, you know, that this book, the way it was produced was also really a product of the time. When I, when I first started writing, I couldn't get an agent. I, I wrote some stories and people were like, uh, they're basically like, these stories are icky. We don't want to, no one cares about trans people. We don't want to read them. And so my next two books, I self-published them. They're my two novellas, I self-published them and I gave them away for free on the internet to trans women. And, uh, and they became sort of these cult books that were passed hand to hand in sort of Brooklyn. And that's really how my reputation was made, not through the publishing industry, but through self-published books circulating on the internet and, and in sort of certain scenes until kind of the publishing industry took notice. I don't think that those circumstances are the same anymore, right? Like my friends are getting book advances. My trans friends are getting book advances. The way that this book, it started out as a novella that I was planning to self-publish and it just got too big. Um, so when I wrote it, I was imagining it to be self-published. I, I didn't think it could, could exist in this world. And between 2014 and, and 2018, suddenly people were interested in the story and, um, and, uh, and it got bigger than I ever possibly imagined. But I think writing this book, everything that was in it, I wrote it thinking that it was gonna be read by 400 people in Brooklyn. And that in a lot of ways freed me to say whatever I wanted. I didn't really care, you know, like I didn't care about piety. I didn't care to be pious about trans stuff. And uh, I think that's gonna be the big challenge for me as a writer going forward is to not fall, is to not say tens of thousands of people might read this book I have to represent well, I have to be pious, I have to just, I think that kind of feeling that you have to represent all trans women is a trap. Mm -hmm. um, and so I spend a lot of time now trying to thrust off the kind of piety that, I, that begins to creep into me where I feel like, oh, it's my job to comment on trans athletes in sports or something. I mean, I have an opinion, but, I'm not qualified to talk about it. I'm not that good at sports. Um, you know, I, I don't really care. I haven't spent time studying it. And, uh, and that's not my job. So, but I have, to, I have to tell myself, I have to remember that like when someone brings up trans women in sports, you can just shut up. You don't have to say anything. You don't represent all trans people. And uh, that's hard to remember. It was easier to remember when I was writing the book. Yeah, yeah, it is hard to remember. And I just, I mean, I, I saw your, I saw a tweet recently from you that said, you know, whenever one of my favorite authors logs off from here forever, I am happy for them the same way I would be happy for someone who is rubbed. <laughs> I yeah. think that's, that's a very wise thing to say. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, I mean, it's tongue in cheek, but I, I do, I do. Whenever an author disappears on Twitter, it's, I'm partly happy because it's like, I know that cycle, but the other thing is that it usually means that they're going to actually do the work that matters. They're off writing somewhere. And, uh, and it means that I'm gonna get a book from them because I much prefer a book from an author than their latest op-ed or certainly their latest tweet. Yeah, um, so I just wanna remind people that if they have questions for Tori, please feel free to put them into the Q&A or into the chat. Um, and so I heard an interview with you, Tori, um, where you said that, you know, before you, you started writing The Transition Baby, you had read um, Maggie Nelson's The Argonauts. And that when you had finished writing The Transition Baby, you reread it and you, yeah. come, you know, and it was a different book for you then. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because, you know, it, The Argonauts is, is probably one of my favorite books. So I'm very interested to hear what your opinions on this. Sure. Mm -hmm. I hated The Argonauts the first time I read it. I, uh, I, 
you know, this, I think when I had talked about it, I said that the, there's that famous essay by Eve Tedrick about the difference between a paranoid reading and a reparative reading. And my first reading of the Argonauts was a paranoid reading. I, it, was this, it was this book by a cis woman about motherhood. <clears throat> and I felt like she had taken all of these trans ideas without acknowledging trans people and applied them to herself as a cis woman to you know kind of <clears throat> kind of make her experience you know to talk about her experience while, you know while ignoring the existence of the people whose ideas she was borrowing largely trans women who were trying to figure out what does it mean to think about motherhood without thinking of a, necessarily like a mother's body and uh and so I was like, this book is 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 erasing us, all these sort of things. And then I uh, I read it again after I finished my book, and I was like, oh, I'm not so worried about where I am in this book anymore. My life has changed. I, I'm not so worried about being erased or that cis women are taking my experience. In fact, almost the opposite. I'm looking for cis women to be interested in my experience and my ideas and to apply them to their own life. And so suddenly what had seemed like erasure the first time that I read the book felt like homage the second time. And, and, that, and I talk about that book as, as in that experience. And I came almost in my own writing in a separate way to a very similar conclusion as Maggie Nelson in the end. And I think that that, that for me, was yeah a, a, a really prime example of reading the book reading a book in a paranoid way and then later on reading it in a reparative way yeah so um one one of the things i've heard you say and i think it was it was quite funny i mean you know we've been talking about tra transitioning and detransitioning but you know you you have said that you know that that cis women can transition um and um, like I think you, you called the Kardashians female to female transsexuals, which I think was, <laughs> which what they think was very funny and yeah, also quite true. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I got in trouble for that joke. Uh, <laughs> it was a joke. I said it very dryly. I have a dry sense of humor, so I was like speaking in an academic way, and I was like, "Cis women, you know, the Kardashians are female to female transsexuals." But I do think that uh, that transition is thought of as a cross gender, but I think a transition is just a gender movement in a lot of ways. And that we're all transitioning in a lot, of, in, a lot in, in many manners with the same kind of rules applying so that you see someone like, the, like Kim Kardashian and you chart her journey. And her journey is not just about, oh, she married Kanye West. It's a gender journey. It's a, it's a, these sort of instantiating events like a sex tape and then and then changing she completely changed her presentation uh you know in order to have access to things in order to be treated a certain way and uh and i think that that the the rules the kind of code that she followed are the same codes that that trans people follow um and you're subjected to the same uh judgments the same misogyny the same you know the way that people talk about Kar kim kardashian's curves as being fake are the same way that people talk about trans women's curves as being fake um, in fact kim kardashian's curves uh tend to be uh the sort of the, the i don't want to objectify her but but the there's a the sort of cut the curves the cut uh cut you know with the contouring so you cut your cheekbones all of that's from drag so which you know got sort of then taken up uh in in sort of black culture by trans black women that got moved back to drag that then got you know taken by the kardashians so the the in sort of the cultural symbols that the kardashians are using it's not even just like they're doing the codes of gender, the codes of gender that they're taking from have trans and queer origins. Um, so to say that they're female to female transsexuals is just to acknowledge uh, that this is a gender movement, that the codes of gender 
are the same for everybody and that the actual reference that the Kardashians are dealing with uh, come from trans culture. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned as well, Evans, um, and I think this applies to, to cis women as well, um, not, not just trans women, um, but, you know, this, these feelings that we have of, of failing at, at being women, you know, that, yeah. you know, women are supposed to act a certain way, they're supposed to dress a certain way, just, you know, they're supposed to take up less space in society. And, um, you know, I, I think that can be, that can be difficult for, for trans women, but also for cis women too. Yeah, I mean, I, I've, a lot of my kinship with women, with cis women, uh, I feel a lot of kinship with cis women and that kinship isn't necessarily around succeeding at womanhood, it's around failing at womanhood, at being judged for the ways that you come up short. And, uh, you know, when I realize that most people feel like they're, they're failing at gender, it, instead of it being like, oh, we're all failures, it felt like, oh, we're all, we're all doing this, we're all in it together. And, um, and I do, yeah, I feel a sense of kinship around that. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, um, there's a scene in the book where, um, you know, you know, where Reese is actually relaxing after being outside. You know, so she's, she, it's, she's described as, as finally slouching. You know, when, when she's outside, she's, you know, she's, um, you know, she's while she's swaying her hips and she's making, you know, it's like she has a pile of books on her head. So she doesn't, you know, she keeps her head straight and this is how, as she's performing gender. So I think this is something that, yeah, it's something that a lot of us do, I think. Well, I mean, it's, it's the same for motherhood. You know, mm. you talk to, to so many mothers and there's so many ways to be told that you're not doing a good job in motherhood, that, you know, you're putting your kids in danger. Or this is the right way to do it, or that's the right way to do it. Or how could you, how could you be such, you know, and motherhood, both in the book and in life, is sort of uh, a crucible for for the ways in which there are these gendered expectations and in which um, we're kind of all constantly navigating uh, we're navigating those expectations we're not always confounding them we're not always con conforming to them but we're we're moving back and forth to try and find our own way in in that against those expectations and against those judgments yeah. So um, one of the things I like to ask writers, um, you know, selfishly, I'm interested in this because I, I have to be dragged kicking and screaming to the top, to the um, computer to write something. Um, what What's your writing routine? Do you, do you have a strict routine? Do you have set times or, or is it um, when I'm when I'm writing while I write in the mornings with coffee um, for three hours? I have not been writing well since this book came out uh, and I'm uh, I'm hoping to reset my schedule and start start claiming those three hours in the morning again. Yeah. So another thing I just want to ask you as well is um, I believe you're a big fan of the um, the Swedish vampire movie that left the right one in. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there, you know you I think think you mentioned there was sort of a trans reading on that. Can you just talk because it because it is a it's it's a really good movie. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I did a talk about Let the Right One In and there's uh, a question of whether or not the, the young vampire is a trans woman. The book hints at it, but what I really am interested in is the way that the, that vampire, that the way that vampirism in general is has always been figured to figured as sort of otherness so in the original sort of uh what is that famous german vampire movie that i'm blanking on the name of um, nosferatu yeah nosferatu uh you know vampirism is 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 an anti-semitic trope right where vampirism is is a stand in for Ju judaism and especially for money uh you know and the, the vampire figure is sort of an anti-Semitic stereotype. And then you have something like true blood in which the vampirism is queerness, that, that that's the other, that it will invade, you know, and, and turn people and steal, their, steal your life force. Um, by the time Let the Right One comes in, it feels to me that there's an argument to be made that the otherness that's happening, not just because it's the girl specifically references maybe trans, but the way that she operates, the way that um, 
the the young boy's attraction to her works um, is along the lines of gender that you could say is a kind of transness that is that is invading that society. So that's that's that was my reading of what the right one in. Um, so we've, we have a question in from the audience um, from Emer Collins. Um, what is your favorite book and why? My favorite book is the is the Elena Ferrante. It's four books, but it is one book. Um, it's Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan Quartet, which I realize is like everybody's favorite book these days. Um, but it just has everything. It's like it's so ferocious. It's so funny. It's so alive. It's so, it just, it, it's, it's, it, every emotion that you can have as a human is in that book and is, is turned up to the 11 in that, in that book. And so it's really become a guide for me to be like, this is what books can do. And I want to write, I want to read books that can do this. And I want to write books that can do this. Yeah. Um... Okay, I, I have to ask this question. Um, I am, um, and um, I read that you like chopping wood to relax. <laughs> so tell me more. <laughs> oh, uh, well, I do sort of like to chop wood. It's more like uh, when I got this cabin, there's a book called Norwegian Wood by a, a Nor well, a Norwegian. Uh, and um, it's very, there's a whole art to chopping wood and a whole art to curing wood. And the way that time passes when you chop wood and you grow new trees and sort of stuff like that. And I think that we live in a cycle of like very rapid fire thinking and very rapid fire, you know, we're constantly in a reactive mode. And that um, when I read this book, Norwegian Wood about chopping wood and about basically, you know, you chop wood in the winter so that you have wood for the following year. And that it's like about planning in advance and thinking about a year in advance on one hand, but it's also a generational project because when you cut down a tree to, to, to use it for wood, if you want your kids to have wood for their wood stove, you should plant a tree for the, your kids. And generally it's about 40 years if you coppice a tree for that tree to grow to maturity so that your children can have warmth. And so the whole process is not only physical, but it has a kind of generational working with the forest kind of feeling that I think is missing in my, missing in, in or had been missing in my daily life for a long time, that kind of long view, that kind of slow thought mm. and physicality. Yeah. Um, so we have an, another question in. Um, so the ending of the book is ambiguous. Was that how you always planned to end the book? I ended the book that way because I think that, that the question is really a generational question, which is how are we going to live now? How are we going to make families? Um, how are we going to how are we going to take action? Um, and how we're going to, there's a lot of ways in which certain types of heterosexuality, you know, there's, there's this whole sort of hetero pessimism thing happening where people are, you know, tired of the way that things are between genders. And um, I think it's, I think it's a generational problem. So in some ways, the book, the book is a, is a question. It's, it's asks, it takes these characters and it strips them of all their coping mechanisms, of all their ideas about what they should or shouldn't have. And at the end of the book, it puts them in a room together and it asks, how are you gonna solve this? In truth, I don't wanna prescribe a solution to this. I don't think that the answer is like, well, form a triad, share a baby and uh, you know, get a two-story house where one house is here and one, you know, I don't think it's a design problem. I don't think it's an architectural problem. I think it's a, it's a problem for an entire generation. And so the ending of the book, I see as a challenge to the reader, which is here they are, here's what they need. Here's what they think when they're not, you know, lying to themselves without any sort of coping. And how would you solve it? Because actually this problem is your problem too. 
Yeah. Um, do, do you think you would ever you know, write a sequel to the book? Um, it, it, it sounds to me like you, you won't, but I'm just, just curious. Would you consider writing a sequel? Or um, or, or do you think that um, would Reese ever, not Reese, I think I would, would Ames ever retransition, do you think, as a character? I would not write a sequel as a novel because I think that the ending is actually, that challenge to the reader is the ending. However, the I have been working on a, adapting it for a TV show. So I've written a pilot and uh, it's was bought by Amazon. And, uh, you know, they want more than one season, which means that I do have to answer this question <laughs> if I want to have a second season. So I'm, uh, I'm considering what, you know, to move past that place of here's where the end was to, to what will happen next. But as of so far, I don't know the answer. I'm, I'm conscious that we're, we're, we're sort of coming up to the end of our time and I don't want to keep you past your time. Um, I did want to, I mean, we, we spoke just, you spoke there about the um, the ending of the novel. Um, it, I mean, the final sentence to me is, is, is absolutely a beautiful sentence. Would you would you read that sentence for us? I think, I think it might be a nice way to sure. finish. Because I think it's that beautiful. Is, that is a nice way to finish. Thank you for giving me that opportunity. Um, they are together and miles from each other, their thoughts turning to themselves, then turning to the baby, each in her own way, contemplating how her tenuous rendition of womanhood has become dependent upon the existence of this little person who is not yet and yet may not be. Oh, so beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for giving me this chance. And, and thank you so much for being so thoughtful in how you ended it. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you. And huge thanks to both of you, Aoife and Tori. That was absolutely such a gorgeous event. Uh, it was the perfect ending to the perfect evening. I hope you both enjoyed it as much as we did. It was such a pleasure to, to listen to both of you tonight. And if anybody hasn't read Tori's book yet, I would strongly encourage you to go out and, and get it. it. It really is marvelous. And I personally can't wait to see what she writes next. And I'm very much looking forward to the TV show. All, all <laughs> six series of it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you everyone and uh, thank you for having me. I hope that someday I get to come in person because uh, I was in Ireland once 20 years ago and I'd love love a chance to return. Well, I'll take you up on that offer. I would love to be taking you both out for a drink now. So next next time we'll definitely arrange something. Perfect. So thank you both. Thank you everyone. Thank you everybody for tuning in and I hope you all Bye. have a wonderful weekend. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye. Thanks Tori. Bye. Thanks Eva.